guys, it's Kristen, also known as Villain Vine, here on my YouTube channel, on Instagram, on Ravelry, and pretty much everywhere else on the interwebs. And today's gonna be a little bit of a different video than I normally put out every week. Uh, and this is actually something that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. And yes, you are probably wondering who this lovely lady is standing next to me. Um, first of all, she is Edith Headless, my lovely mannequin that I use for fitting garments when I'm sewing, and she's currently wearing an extant antique Edwardian bodice that I picked up from an antique shop while I was in Cape Cod over the summer. And just a little bit of context, uh, every summer I usually go up to Cape Cod and visit this antique shop, and this has been hanging in said shop for as long as I can remember. Every year that I would go, I would be just so tempted to buy it, and finally, over the summer, I pulled the trigger and I purchased it. It was $50 <laughs> and I mean it you can tell right over here off the bat it clearly was attached to something else and I'm not sure if it was a full gown or it just had a stomacher or um, a, a waistband or something but clearly it was whatever was below it was damaged enough where they just cut off the bottom and the top remained. Uh, it's just a really cool thing to open up and study the construction and see how things were finished and I totally geek out over this stuff. Again, I've been wanting to do a video giving you guys a little tour about it and talking about it. Um, I did some research and Disclaimer, I am not a professional, I am not a historian, I am not certified by any means. Uh, this is my own research that I've found through online sources, through books, um, and I'm going to do my best to kind of tell you more about this garment. And yes, it is Bushwick and it is noisy and there's a truck backing up somewhere. So the yoke over here is uh, just plain lace that is underlined with, I believe, like a cotton, cotton or linen or silk, I believe. Um, and then, yeah, it's ruched right here. I'm not exactly sure what this fabric is. It, it could be a silk. I'm not entirely sure. It does have a very nice sheen to it. Um, I know silks don't usually hold up this well. So if it is silk, they did a really wonderful job of preserving it and just keeping it away from the elements. Um, I try not to handle this as much <laughs> with my own bare hands, but it's kind of... Um, impossible because yeah, research, science. So after doing a little research, looking at illustrations and books such as Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 2, I've kind of come to the conclusion that this bodice may have been from the very, very late 1800s to the early 1900s. And what leads me to that conclusion is that if you look at the bodice, there's a lot of extra fabric right here. In the early 1900s, the pigeon pigeon look was in. Uh, and if you're, not, if you're familiar with a pigeon, you know that pigeon chests have a tendency to want to curve out like that. And that look was very, very in at the time, around 1900. Uh, and obviously this would be worn over a corset and a corset cover. And the corset cover would have ruffles on it to kind of give body to the outer garment, so to speak. So yeah, wearing all those layers with the ruffles underneath on the corset cover, this would want to protrude out giving you that desired pigeon effect um, and then the corset in turn uh, at the time the S bend or the S curve corset was in so that corset also known as the health corset would push your body straight your the front of your body straight down and bend your back um, in and because crinolines were being faded out, uh, many Edwardian ladies just wore a, bu a simple bustle pad in the back. So just popping in to say, if you are of the mind that corsets are the devil, they're evil, and they constrict women way too much, that is completely false. Uh, there are many sources that, de that debunk these myths. While tight lacing was a thing, not many women did it. So when you see those illustrations and photographs of women with the wasp, wasp waists, that was either a photo trick or Many of the, the shapes that were achieved were done through padding. Padding was a huge thing. So again, with the bustle pad in the back of the dress and then the the ruffles in the front on the corset cover would push the, the chest forward. That's what would give the illusion of the pigeon chest and the tiny wasp waist. So I find that so fascinating. So I think, I think early 1900s is where this lady is from. So again, you know, you have a, you know, a lace yoke that's underlined with silk and then ruches and then these pleats that kind of gather down into 
here, which I find interesting. It's not, it's, it's, I'm not gonna lie, it looks a little slapdash. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised. It was probably a homemade garment. You can see it was top stitched over here. Uh, this is ju probably just a, a scrap piece of fabric unless they intended this to be diagonal. I'm sure it's just a little placket that they put on top to conceal the, the gathering stitches over here. The sleeves are very, very interesting. Um, I don't know too much about sleeves. I have to study those a little bit more, but uh, yeah, I think I think that covers the front. Let's talk about the back. So Edith Headless is scaled to fit my body. She's got a bra on, but you know, whatever. This is not obviously historically accurate. She's wearing a modern day bra, but just for demonstration purposes, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna pretend. So whoever was the owner of this beautiful uh, garment was a lot tinier than me, or, or, I only have one hand right now, but I imagine if I had a corset on, um, this might just fit around my waist, but up here, I think it's a different story, um, but hey, uh, so let's, let's take a look at this, um, so yes, here's like the, the facing on the collar that goes around, so there are just some simple hook and eye closures, going all the way down the back. She would definitely have needed help <laughs> putting this on every day because no way in heck could I do this on my own. I don't know, it just seems like it was completely hand sewn and it's very, very neat work. And I love, I love the, um, you can see the, the silk underlining that's underneath the, the lace. Um, this, I'm sure it's probably silk and it was probably homemade uh, if I had to guess. Um, and this seems like basic cotton, cotton lining. Uh, it's not patterned. And let me see, yeah, so it's faced inside. On this side, some more of the same. Um, yeah, so, all right, let's pull it off the mannequin and see what it all looks like on the insides. I just have this lying on my sofa right now so we can see and spread it out. But um, I noticed, I looked at some of the seam finishes in here and there's a cacophony <laughs> or a medley of, of different seam finishes. So really, really awesome to kind of like study all the different seams that were used or seam finishes that were used back in the day. Um, and this right here is called a Hong Kong seam finish. Uh, it's where you just encase the raw edges in some bias binding, um, not by, uh, not bias tape, but kind of like a silk, um, like a silk kind of uh, tape, if you will, which is still used today. Um, it, again, it's called a Hong Kong um, finish. So, and there's that. And then you can see they pinked some of the seams. So, you know, before, um, I forget when pinking shears were actually invented. They were re invented around eight, like the late 1800s, and they didn't become what we know as pinking shears until like 1920 something. So, uh, but it seems like, I, I can't tell if these were done by hand, these pinked edges or a, a specific scissor that actually made them. Um, but yeah, they were just, uh, you know, pinked and then pressed to one side. And then, you know, here you have some more pinking. And then here's where things get really juicy. <laughs> um, the arm side. At the end of the day, I think they really just cared about what the outside looked like and not so much the inside. So you can see, I don't know if this was altered at some point, but it's just a simple, they were just stitched and then some of these edges were left raw. And then here, along where the silk uh, it was just basically basted and double stitched, <laughs> double row stitching, very slapdash. And over here, because uh, you have two fabrics that are flat lined together, um, whoever sewed this just did a simple whip stitch along the edge to finish those seams to prevent them from unraveling. Um, and then here you have the collar facing, which was obviously just hand whip stitched down here. And I can't get over this beautiful silk under here. Oh, so pretty. The front portion of the bodice, <laughs> you can see the stitching over here where the gathers come down and then that square, that awkward square piece that went in the front to encase them. And you can feel, I'm feeling right here, I can feel the gathers that are under there. So yeah, there's that. And then I'm trying to think if there is anything else um, to write home about. I mean, for a $50 antique store find, I've gleaned and learned so much from this. No regrets whatsoever. Uh, I'm just 
oh yeah, I mean, look at that, it's so cool. This must be silk, um, again. I'm not a professional, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning and having a lot of fun with it. So anyway, um, if anything, I think I've just geeked completely out over the different seam finishes and learning where the, you know, what year this might have been from. All right guys, the light is waning, so I think here is a good place to end the video. Um, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> the tour of this, this gorgeousness right here. Um, I had a lot of fun learning about it and hope to learn more from it. Uh, maybe even try and replicate it at some point. Again, this is not the normal format of my YouTube channel, but if you did enjoy this video, please feel free to like and subscribe down below. I put out a regular episode every Friday for your viewing pleasure. And yeah, if you did enjoy this and want to see more videos like this, uh, you know, again, let me know in the comments below if you have any questions. Uh, I shall endeavor to answer those questions or at least point you in the right direction where you might be able to find answers to said questions. Before I ramble on for more than need be, <laughs> I will end things there. Uh, happy knitting, happy sewing, happy making, and I'll see you next time. Bye!